Hi, my name's Alison Knurth, and today we are going to be looking at two of the most interesting examples of life on Earth, namely viruses and bacteria. We're going to start with viruses. By the end of this section on viruses, there are a number of things that you'll need to know. These will include, first of all, their basic structure and general characteristics, diseases that may be caused by viruses, as well as medical biotechnology. When we look at the bacteria section, there are also a number of aspects that are important for your examinations. These will include the basic structure and general characteristics of bacteria, their ecological role, how they are important economically, diseases that they can cause, as well as medical biotechnology. Let's start our lesson looking at viruses. A number of terms have been given to you in a glossary at the beginning of the section. We're going to skip those terms right now, but we'll come back to those towards the end of the lesson. So let's jump right in to look at the structure and general characteristics of viruses. Before we look at a proper diagram of a virus, I'm going to draw a very, very simplified form just to highlight some of the characteristics that viruses show. Do excuse the drawing skills. All viruses have a symmetrical outer coat made of protein. This symmetrical outer coat is often referred to as a capsid, but it is always made of protein. Sometimes you will find that on this capsid are very, very strange projections that may look like buttons. And I'll show you some examples of those in a moment. Secondly, inside the virus, you will only find one thing. One single strand of nucleic acid. Now, normally what you will find is this nucleic acid depends on what the virus is going to infect. If the host is an animal, then usually the nucleic acid is DNA. If the host for the virus is a plant, usually the nucleic acid that is found is RNA. Now, that is the structure of a virus. There are no organelles, there's no mitochondrion, no cytoplasm, no specialized structures. So what does that mean about what my virus can and cannot do? Well, firstly, this virus cannot move. Because they cannot move independently, viruses are transmitted from one to person or one organism to another via droplets or blood or food or water. In fact, pretty much any method can carry viruses. Our next point, viruses do not feed. Besides not feeding, they also do not undergo respiration and because of that they have no way of producing energy for themselves. Viruses also show no metabolism whatsoever. They also do not grow. In other words, there are many, many things that viruses do not do. Let's look at some of the things that they can do. Viruses can 
reproduce. And this is the only time that a virus is actually active. A virus must have a plant cell or an animal cell as its host, and it will use that cell to enable it to reproduce. Note that it does not use the cell to feed or anything else. Also, viruses can mutate. When we say that a virus mutates, it involves a slight change in the virus. And we'll look at an example of that a little bit later on. Now, if you look at the list of things that a virus can do and that it cannot do, it is no wonder that there is an incredible debate as to whether viruses are actually living or not. In fact, viruses can even crystallize which is a characteristic shown by chemicals. A final and particularly important point that may help you to decide whether you think they are living or not, viruses cannot be killed by antibiotics. Antibiotics only work to kill living organisms that are multiplying inside your body, and they have absolutely no effect whatsoever on viruses interesting point. Let's look at a slightly more detailed picture of a virus. If you look at this picture you will see the same parts that I mentioned earlier but this virus is a little more complicated. First of all here you can see the protein coat or remember that the other term for that is the capsid. Second thing that you can see here inside this is your nucleic acid. Now remember that I said that usually animal viruses have DNA and plant viruses have RNA. Well this is an exception to that rule. This belongs to a group called retroviruses. They are animal viruses and when they get into an animal cell, then they will change their RNA into DNA. The next thing that I'd like to point out about our picture is if you look outside the protein coat or capsid. Here, you can see that there are special, special little buttons on stalks. These little buttons are made of a substance called a glycoprotein. These are incredibly important in helping the virus to target its host. Then these buttons are attached onto a lipid envelope that goes all the way around the protein coat. So here, this part over here, that shows you where this lipid envelope lies. Now that is a schematic diagram of a virus. Let's look at a couple of examples of real viruses. And most of these were taken using the scanning electron microscope. This first virus that you can see on your screen is the virus that is responsible for causing bird flu. This virus over here is HIV. Please be careful when you talk about HIV. Remember that you need to know that HIV means human immunodeficiency virus, but you cannot talk about the HIV virus because then you're using the word virus twice. This example here is the hepatitis virus and hepatitis is a very, very nasty virus that infects your liver and makes a person incredibly unwell. This picture over here shows a virus that we'll be looking at in a very short while. This is the rabies virus. Our final example is something that we have all experienced. We have all had this little virus reproducing away madly inside our cells. This is the common garden variety influenza virus. Influenza is a virus that tends to mutate very, very easily. 
Now, what is going to happen in your body when you inhale this influenza virus? These little influenza particles will travel into your nasal cavity and they will attach themselves to the mucous membrane that lines your nasal cavity. The viruses will burrow their way into the cells and take over your cells and turn them into little flu virus factories as they fill up with more and more and more viruses and burst out. Now what is going to happen is your body is going to react to this by mounting an immune response. What will happen is white blood cells will flock to the area to try to neutralize the virus. And what they'll do is they'll manufacture special substances called antibodies. Now antibodies are very, very important because they will target these viruses and they will destroy them. Now the wonderful thing about an antibody is once it's been made in your body, it will stay there for the rest of your life. So then, why do you get flu every single time it gets cold? Remember, the flu virus mutates easily. So this year, you will get influenza virus A. Next year, you will get influenza virus B. So every time you get flu, it's a brand new virus that you're getting and that your body has to react to and make antibodies to. Let's look at some of the characteristics then that we have discussed and elaborate on a few more as regards viruses. First of all, remember that a virus is a microscopic organism. Viruses have a core of DNA if they attack animals or RNA if they attack plants. Remember that is general because we do get that special group called retroviruses. Our third point, a protein capsule called a capsid surrounds the central core. There are no cells. They have no nucleus, no cytoplasm, no mitochondria, no ribosomes. In fact, very little that you would find in a normal cell. Viruses are non-cellular. They do not feed, respire, grow, excrete, or show any kind of metabolism. Viruses are also classified as prokaryotes. A prokaryote is defined as something that has no organized nucleus. Now when we talk about an organized nucleus, what we are referring to is a nucleus with a nuclear membrane and normally a nucleolus. So to do a little sketch of it, it will look something like this. There's my nuclear membrane, nucleolus, and there's my nucleic acid. Now that is a properly organized nucleus. Viruses are classified as prokaryotic. What this means is they are lacking a nucleolus, they are lacking a nuclear membrane. All that they have is that single strand, or in the case of the retroviruses, a double strand of nucleic acid. Viruses only reproduce in living animal or plant cells. And what is important to note is that it is their process of reproduction that will make the plant or animal sick. All viruses are parasites. Every single living organism has one or more viruses that will infect it. However, we need to bear in mind that unlike other parasites, viruses are not using their host cell for food. They are only using the host cell as an incubator to reproduce. Viruses are very, very specific. A virus will only attack a certain kind of host. Some of them go a little bit further and they will only attack a certain kind of tissue in a specific host. As such, we call them host 
specific. Another example, the tobacco mosaic virus will only infect tobacco plants. Mumps virus, which infects us and makes us feel very, very miserable indeed as our whole face swells up, will only live in our salivary glands. Viruses can cause many diseases in plants and animals, such as AIDS, rabies, mumps as mentioned, measles, smallpox, poliomyelitis, which we normally just call polio, yellow fever, and the common cold. Viruses reproduce by transforming the host's nucleic acids into virus nucleic acids. Now remember, that's what I said to you about the virus using the host cell as an incubator. And literally, that host cell is caused to make protein coats for new viruses and to make new DNA or RNA for the new viruses. As was mentioned, antibiotics and other medicines are not effective against viruses since they are not living. For convenience, we usually put viruses into Kingdom Monera along with bacteria. Remember that I said earlier that all viruses cause disease in their host. This is why they are called pathogens. Some examples include rabies, HIV, and please remember this is the virus, this is the syndrome caused by the effects that the virus has created once it has worked on your immune system, or influenza, or the common flu. Rabies is a virus that has quite a large range of hosts. It can affect humans, domestic animals, wild animals such as the mongoose, and it has a rather nasty effect on an organism's body. Rabies is carried in the saliva of an animal that is, is infected. This means that the rabies virus can only be transmitted from an animal that has it to a new host by means of a bite. The virus will then replicate itself, which means it will make copies of itself. And remember that it has to burrow into a host cell to make these copies. And then these new copied viruses will burst out of the host cells and they will start to spread through the body. They will travel through the nervous system and they will end up in the brain and the spinal cord. First of all, the infected animal will become nervous, irritable and very, very aggressive. It is during this stage that the infected animal will normally bite another organism and that's why it's important to remember never approach a strange animal. Paralysis will start to set in in our host animal. The animal becomes unable to swallow and may start foaming at the mouth. The paralysis that sets in is progressive it normally begins around the jaw area and then starts to move through the whole rest of the body. The big problem is, once these symptoms have set in, treatment is no longer an option. This disease ends in death if not caught very quickly. Any time that you are bitten by a dog or a wild animal, you must immediately go to a hospital or a clinic. In many cases, you do not know whether the animal has rabies or not, so it is always best to take precautions. At the hospital or clinic, the wound will then be cleaned and you will be given an anti-tetanus injection, which will hopefully prevent any kind of infection continuing through your body. Let's look at the concept of a vaccination, as this is one of the most important steps in medical technology that has been developed. 
when you go for an immunization, for example, at the beginning of winter, you go for the flu injection. What happens is a form of the virus that has been treated beforehand by radiation or other methods to change its contents and make it non-infective, that is injected into your bloodstream. In other words, you will find that just the viral coat is injected into your bloodstream. The nucleic acid content has been destroyed. But your white blood cells, and specifically your T cells, will respond to this foreign body in your bloodstream. They will come along and manufacture antibodies. You might find that the virus has glycoprotein buttons arranged like this. Your T cells, or white blood cells, will make antibodies that will prevent this virus from getting into any of your body cells. These antibodies are then going to stay in your blood for the rest of your life. This particular viral particle in the vaccination was never going to make you sick. It doesn't have the nucleic acid content. But because it has the particular patterns on its protein coat, antibodies can be manufactured to prevent you ever getting that specific kind of sickness. Immunity. That is what is built up in our bodies by antibodies. In other words, it means that we have resistance to a particular infection. That means we can never get that virus again microorganisms. These are organisms that can only be seen through a microscope, so remember that means that they are very, very small indeed. A parasite. Viruses are parasites because they use host cells in order to reproduce. A parasite will always damage its host in some way, and with viruses it damages the host by making it sick. The term pathogen is any organism that causes disease. All viruses are pathogens. Prokaryotes, remember that a prokaryote is something that does not have a properly developed nucleus. All that it has is the strand of nucleic acid. A vaccination or immunization is where the body is artificially exposed to a form of the virus that has been rendered harmless. This means that you will make antibodies that will stay in your blood for the rest of your life. Let's look at some examples of questions that you may be asked in your examinations. The first question deals with the measles virus and you are given a graph showing you the average number of new measles cases over the time in years. The first question asks, in which two years did the number of cases constitute an epidemic? An epidemic means that there are large numbers of people who are infected by a particular disease. So if we look at the graph, you can see that the numbers were highest here, in 1920 and then here in 1923. So those are your answers and each one will get you one mark. The next part of this question deals with a reason for the pattern of the graph from 1921 to 1923. When we look at a pattern we have to start by talking about the beginning, describing what happens, and then move to the end of the time period given. So, in 1921, there were 100 new measles cases notified, and the same number in 1922. When we get to 1923, however, you can see that there's quite a dramatic increase in the number of new cases. The number given is 200. 
Thus, we have an increase of 100 cases in this time period. Now you have to suggest a reason for why this is the case. There are a number of possible reasons here. We could, first of all, have a new strain of measles. Secondly, because we are talking about the 1920s, perhaps in those times, hygiene was not as good as it is at present. This may mean that it was far, far easier for people to contract the disease because they weren't really too careful about washing their hands, covering their mouths when they sneeze, and so on. Other possible reasons could include an influx of visitors from a different country carrying the virus with them. Please note that any reason that you give here, you are asked for a reason, thus it is one reason which you have to explain for two marks. The next question requires that you explain the information given in the graph. Here you will start by saying in 1920 there are 300 new cases of measles that were notified. You will then go on to explain how that number drops over the next two recording periods, that there is a sudden increase in 1923, whereafter the number of new cases drops again. When you are asked to explain the information given, you must always refer to the graph to explain the pattern that is shown. So 1920, we have 300 new cases. Then you can say 1921 and 1922 that it has decreased, increases again in 1923, and quite a dramatic decrease in 1924. Let's look at another example. Question 2 is a slightly different format question, as here we are dealing with a reading study. It is a good idea to bring highlighters or colored pens into an exam with you so that you can indicate the parts of the reading study as you go through it that you might find of importance later on. So question 2, we are dealing with a reading study in a passage before we answer the questions. Flu or influenza is a highly infectious disease caused by viruses. Research has shown there are different types of flu viruses. And when you get flu, your body builds up an immunity against a second flu, at, but please note, from the same type of virus. Flu injections, which prevent against flu infections, are not 100% effective because flu viruses can mutate. The vaccine, thus, must be continuously adapted. The flu virus strains usually only differ slightly from one year to the next. Sometimes there is a very different strain so that existing vaccines are not effective and this may cause worldwide pandemics. Now there's a new word pandemic. It's not the same thing as an epidemic. We'll look at that in a moment. First question, why is flu considered to be a highly infectious disease? Flu is one of the viral diseases that is transmitted incredibly easily from one person to the next. You will find flu viruses in droplets that are projected out of a person's mouth and nose whenever they sneeze. So to answer this question, first of all, look at the mark allocation. This is for two marks. So why is it highly infectious? We're going to start by saying that it's easily transmitted. And you could mention here via things like droplets or by contact. Be careful with this kind of a question. Because it is for two marks, we're not sure if the examiner wants you to give two points or if it is one point 
for two marks. As a result, always make sure that your answer has enough information in it in case it is only one mark allocated per given point. The next question that is set on this, what is the incubation period for flu? An incubation period is the period that the virus particles are inside your body. They are busy reproducing or replicating themselves, but you have not yet displayed any symptoms. In the case of flu, this varies a little bit. The average incubation period for the influenza virus is more or less three days. There are, however, people in which this three days, it might take a little longer. It can go as far as one week. But generally, I would say that the incubation period you should give three days for one mark. According to the passage, your body builds up an immunity against a second flu attack. Why can a person keep getting flu over and over again? Remember that the answer to this lies in the specific information given earlier about the flu virus. Flu viruses mutate very quickly and very easily. As a result, they have changed. Because of this, every time you get flu, you are getting a slightly different variation of the flu virus. Each time you get flu, you are getting a new type of virus. So, to award marks for this question, we should look at mutating quickly and easily, and that every time you get it, you're getting a new virus, which will give you the two marks required. The next question on this reading study deals with that new word. The new word is pandemic. These viruses usually cause worldwide pandemics. In other words, a pandemic is going to be a lot of people getting sick at the same time on a worldwide basis. So here, for two marks, we will say many people having the same disease. And here we will add in our over the world. And that will give us a mark for that and many people with the same disease. And there's our two marks for this question. Question three, we are going to be dealing with a table and it involves projections formulated by a South African life insurance company. A projection is a possible estimation of figures in future. They may differ slightly from other available figures, but they clearly show the relevant trends. And then we are given a table with a lot of data in. We are given adult HIV percentage across a number of years. There's the HIV prevalence in millions across the same years. AIDS cases in thousands. Now be careful because you can see that we're working with different units in this question. Already so far, we have percentage, we have millions, and we have thousands. So be very careful when you're answering to give the correct unit. Our next row, AIDS deaths. Again, you can see thousands. There's the numbers for the totals and the adults and the children. And then we're dealing with AIDS orphans. Now, there's no unit given here, so we presume that these are the actual numbers. The first part of the question reads, in many African countries, the rate of infection is slower in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Suggest why this is not the case 
in South Africa? This is quite a tricky question. And you can see that it has been asked for two marks. We could say that in our rural areas, there are lower levels of education. We could say that there are fewer clinics or hospitals that are available for treatment. Some of our rural areas are quite far flung as well, so the medication may be difficult to get to the rural areas. And here, when we talk about the medication, we use ARV antiretrovirals. All right? Antiretrovirals is the medication specifically designed to help those who are HIV positive. So here is our next answer. We will say ARVs, um, we will say the supply is not regular. Or we could add in that often our rural areas are quite difficult to reach. Now, I would suggest that for this kind of a question, it does not say suggest one way or two ways. Again, look at your mark allocation. In this case, the question is worth two marks. Thus, of these, give any two. The next part of the question, here is our table repeated. In 1998, HIV, in fact, infected approximately 3 million people. By how many cases was this projection incorrect? In 1998, there is our millions. It had infected, they projected, 2.7 million people. But in fact, it affected 3 million. Thus, we're going to say 3 million minus 2 comma 7 million to get our answer. So in other words, you could express it like this, minus 2 comma 7. Either of these two forms is acceptable as long as you remember to give your unit at the end. If you've used this method, your answer will be 0 comma 3 million. Or if you've used this method, you will have 300,000 and there, cases, cases. And whichever method you use, you will get one mark for that correct answer. Let's move on. In 3.3, .3, we are still referring to our table of data. It was projected that in the year 2000, there would be 3.6 million HIV-positive people in South Africa. There were, in fact, about 4.2 million affected. Now, here comes the question part. Does this suggest that the prevalence of HIV-AIDS is decreasing? Now, if you look at it, we have gone, they said that there would be 3.6 million. There were, in fact, 4.2 million. Is the prevalence of HIV AIDS decreasing? Simple answer. And for that alone, you will get two marks. The next part of question three involves reading data from the table directly. Again, we are given our table here so you can refer to it. And its question reads, how many AIDS orphans are there projected to be in South Africa in the year 2010. So here is our orphans. Remember there's no unit given, so we presume that these numbers are units. We go all the way to the 2010 column and the answer is 1936, 1936 and always write AIDS orphans. And one mark for that. Moving on, in what year is it projected that approximately half a million South Africans will die from AIDS? Now, this is a little bit of a tricky question. 
The reason it's tricky is if we look at the side of our table with our row headings. Here are our AIDS deaths. This number is given in thousands, but the question is asking us for half a million. So we've got to be careful when we answer this question. What we're going to do with this question, we're going to look along our total number until we see these two figures. Can you see 433? Remember it's thousands, so it'll have three zeros on the end. 505, remember it's thousands, so three zeros on the end. So, in which year do we expect a half a million? This is the closest to a half a million, therefore our answer, 2008. One mark. In this question, we are expected to draw a bar graph to show the number of AIDS deaths from the information given above. Now, when we draw a bar graph, there are certain rules that we have to follow. First of all, remember that your bar graph must always have a heading. Your heading should include two variables and a time if given. So in our heading, make sure that you include the following. First of all, start by saying that it is a bar graph. And what is this bar graph going to show? It's going to show the number of AIDS deaths. And that's our first variable. Where are we talking about specifically? In South Africa. That's our second variable. And because we're asked to do it over a number of years, let's add that into our heading just to be 100% sure. I'm going to say over time, but you could go back to the table, say from 1998 to 2010 over a 12-year period. That's the first thing as regards giving a heading. Always underline your heading so that it stands out from your graph. The next thing that you're going to do is you're going to draw in your axes. On the x-axis at the bottom, what we're going to put is the specific time and we're going to do it in the given years. Please remember that as far as possible you have to say what each axis is showing and what unit are you using to measure it in because in some cases one mark may be awarded for each of these. For example, you might get a mark for time and you might get a mark for year as well. So rather give them just in case. When you draw a bar graph, remember that you are plotting here the years at the bottom. You will need to have a ruler, which unfortunately I don't have. Be very careful that you measure very carefully. A bar graph must have spaces between the bars, and those spaces must all be the same size. So, I'll try and get it as close as I can. We would start our first year over here and say, for example, measure this to be a centimeter with a centimeter from the y-axis to begin. Leave a centimeter open, do another line, another centimeter, and this would be our first group, 1998, and I think the second one is 2000, so it's every two years. Leave a centimeter, measure a centimeter, 2002, leave a centimeter, etc. Be very careful with doing those intervals exactly the same size. They are checked in your final exam. On the y-axis, here we're going to be doing the number of AIDS deaths. Now, what are we measuring our number of AIDS deaths in? Our number of AIDS deaths are measured in thousands. And again, please note, we have given what we are measuring 
and the unit that we are measuring it in. Before you decide to fill in the intervals on the y-axis, go back to the data given and just look how high up you will have to go. Here are our AIDS deaths, 86, 156. So our highest number that we're going to go is 551. When you plot the spaces on your y-axis, always, always indicate a zero. Then you need to decide on even intervals to increase in along the length of the y-axis. If we've got to go up to 551, it's probably a good idea to use 50s. This will work like this. Measure 50. Measure 100. Measure 150, etc. until you get to 550. Once you have indicated your axes very, very clearly, use your ruler to fill in the values on the sides. Our first number is 86. 86 should be more or less over here. Please use your ruler. Again, I don't have one. There is my first bar. It is not compulsory, but you can, if you would like, fill in the number 86 at the top. It's not compulsory, but it often makes it clearer. Once you've graphed the first bar, go back to your data, 156, measure, whoops, and I haven't gone far enough. There we go. 156, let's say it's going to be about there. So you continue until all of your values have been plotted. Graphs are normally marked for 10 to 13 marks. Where do these marks come from? I have already given you the marks here and here. Then you will get a mark for even spacing along your x-axis. In other words, that your bars are all the same thickness and that the spaces in between are all the same size. For that, a mark is normally put on the x-axis. On the y-axis, what are you measuring? what unit are you using, and as well for the fact that you have gone up in even intervals. Please be careful with that one. In your table, you're given very, very, very strange numbers. Do not plot those numbers. You must use the ones, the even intervals that you've decided on, because you'll get another mark for that. You are then marked on plotting and people will actually check that you have plotted all of the various points correctly. And for plotting, it is one or two marks. In the case of some graphs, it can even go up to three marks. You will get a mark, number of AIDS deaths in South Africa. Sometimes there may be a third mark allocated for the time interval. And then a T mark, which is for drawing the correct type of graph. Those mark the end of our questions on viruses. The next group of organisms that we are going to look at are bacteria. Bacteria are also classified as microorganisms in that you need a microscope to be able to see them and they are very, very small. This diagram shows you a bacterial cell. Bacteria are very different to viruses in that they display all of the characteristics of living organisms. They can either make their own food or feed on other substances. They metabolize, grow, excrete, respire, etc. On the outside of our bacterial cell over here is a slime capsule. This capsule is incredibly important to the bacterial cell as it prevents it from drying out. Often you will find bacteria living in water or in drops of water. However, you do find bacteria everywhere. You find them in soil, you find them on your skin, you find them in your body, on door handles, on tap handles, and whilst they are not immersed in water, the slime capsule protects them. It also offers a limited degree of protection against medicines, which we'll look at in a moment. 
Underneath the slime capsule, over here, is the cell wall. A bacterial cell wall is made of cellulose. Underneath the cell wall is a layer called the cell membrane, or the correct biological term for this, the plasma lemma. You can see these very, very strange projections from the bacterial cell. These are little whip-like projections called flagelli. And these are to help the bacteria move around in water. They whip them back and forth at quite a speed. And you may find that a bacterial cell may have several, one long one, or a number of shorter projections called cilia. Inside the bacterial cell, over here, you will see a collection of nucleic acid. This nucleic acid does not have a nuclear membrane around it, and therefore we describe this as a prokaryotic nucleus. Instead of using the word nucleus, you can call this a nucleoid. The oid part means that it is like a nucleus, but not quite as advanced. Some bacteria have an extra ring of genetic material just outside this nucleoid. It would lie, for example, over here, and that is called a plasmid. Plasmids are incredibly important in genetic engineering. Other than that, you will find ribosomes lying loose in the cytoplasm. Here, the cytoplasm itself. There are no mitochondria, there are no vacuoles, there are no other organelles at all. You can see that bacterial cells are very, very simple indeed. However, what is important is that because these are living organisms, you will find that both antibiotics and antiseptics will work to kill bacteria. Antibiotics are the pills that you will take to kill bacteria from the inside. An antiseptic is a cream that you will rub on your skin which will kill any bacteria that may be causing infections on your skin. Here, just so that you can check, are the correct labels with the spelling to go with this diagram. Learn to both draw and label this diagram very, very well as it is a very important spot type question. Let's move on. Bacteria normally exist in three general shapes. Here are some electron micrographs to show you the three possible shapes. Here is the first type of bacterial shape. You can see a whole lot of little round bacteria. The round shape is correctly called a coccus, which is spelt C-O-C-C-U-S. Sometimes these bacteria will occur in chains or in bunches that look sort of like grapes. And what is often quite frightening is that these live on your skin, using the pores of your skin as their homes. The second shape that you can see are these strange twisted ones. The correct term for this spiral-shaped bacterium is a spirillum. The third and most common shape and this is normally the one that you'll be asked to draw, as you saw in our schematic drawing earlier, is this shape. It is called the bacillus shape, and that is a rod-shaped bacteria. Sometimes you might find a variation on this bacillus shape, where the bacterium looks a little bit more like a boomerang. That kind of a shape is called a vibrio. A further electron micrograph that I would like to show you is that of bacteria reproducing. 
Because bacteria are incredibly, incredibly simple, they can reproduce very, very quickly. The way they reproduce is a process called binary fission. This is an important terminology word. Binary fission can occur every 15 minutes. So bacteria can reproduce and grow to full size within that period of time. If you look, you can see that we are dealing with the round or cocos shaped bacteria. And here you can see this one is splitting itself in two. Binary fission involves the original bacterial cell making a copy of its nucleic acid. The copy will move to either side of the original cell and this new cell wall will start to form to divide the cell in two. If we had to put their growth form onto a graph, here are the axes of number of bacteria and it'll be over time. And I'm not going to fill in details because I just want to give you a general idea. If we take a few bacteria and put them into a petri dish, their numbers will at first be quite low. For example, like that. However, provided there is enough food and space for them, the bacteria will reproduce incredibly quickly by binary fission, meaning that your graph is going to start to look like this. This is what we call a J-shaped growth form or a geometric growth form. When we get to this point at the top over here, what you will find happening is that food is starting to run out, that conditions are becoming very, very crowded inside our little petri dish. We call this environmental resistance. As a result, as quickly as those bacteria grew, so too can their numbers decrease. Here is the original infection in your body. This is you getting more and more sick as the numbers of bacteria increase. You hopefully then will go on to a course of antibiotics. The antibiotics will work on the bacteria and cause their numbers to drop down, hopefully to zero. But unfortunately what tends to happen because we start feeling better after two or three days of a course of antibiotics, we stop taking the pills. What then happens? We have not killed all of the bacteria. As a result, because there are a few left and there are plenty of cells in our body for them to feed on, the numbers will simply start to increase again. But the problem is that as soon as you have finished taking your antibiotics too soon, the bacteria in your body may become resistant to further doses of that antibiotic. So if you get to this point where you are feeling very, very unwell and might need to start a new course of antibiotics, what you'll find is you'll probably have to go on a stronger dosage or for a longer period. And this time, Make sure that you complete the course of antibiotics. Let's look at the basic structure and general characteristics just to revise those. First of all, bacteria are very small. They are unicellular and, as I said, can only be seen in a microscope. I also mentioned that you find them almost everywhere. Soil, air and water inside yourself, on yourself, on other organisms, and on other surfaces. The correct word for things being found everywhere, we say they are cosmopolitan. A bacterial cell has no organelles like mitochondria and no true nucleus. The reason that it has no true nucleus is that the nucleus present has no nuclear membrane. So in other words, just the nuclear material, which we call prokaryotic. Therefore, 
There is the correct term and the spelling for you. Then the shapes of bacteria are mentioned, the coccus, bacillus, spirillum, and remember the vibrio, which is the variation on the bacillus. As regards the structure of bacterial cells, slime capsule for protection, cell wall, polysaccharides like cellulose, there's our flagella for movement, cytoplasm, plasma lemma, no nucleus, but remember we use the term nucleoid. And of course, we have ribosomes present. Now, why we have ribosomes? Wherever ribosomes are present in a cell, it is for the process of protein synthesis. Bacteria are incredibly, incredibly important. They play both an ecological and an economic role in the world. First of all, Bacteria are decomposers. A decomposer is anything that feeds on dead or decaying matter and breaks it down. Bacteria as decomposers are saprophytes. That is quite an important terminology word. A saprophyte is the correct term for something that feeds on dead or decaying matter. By breaking down the dead organisms, they are going to get their own energy, but they will release some nutrients into the soil. A very important nutrient that is released into the soil is the nutrient nitrates. Because of the action of decomposers, you will find that the soil becomes enriched and therefore becomes very fertile. Bacteria play a very, very important role in the treatment of sewage. Remember that sewage is organic material that is flushed down from your toilet and taken to a sewage farm. In the sewage farm, the products lie in huge vats into which bacteria are introduced. The bacteria feed on the sewage and almost help in the purification of that water. Often the water that is produced from this may be used for watering crops and so forth. Still ecologically speaking, bacteria play a role in fixing nitrogen. Nitrogen is a particularly important nutrient for all living organisms. We need nitrogen to manufacture proteins in our bodies, and so do all other organisms. So in other words, when we manufacture food in our bodies or when plants undergo photosynthesis, they will take carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and to manufacture proteins, they will add on nitrogen. We find nitrogen in the air that we breathe in, in the form of N2. But, however much we breathe in, we breathe exactly the same amount right back out again. We cannot absorb nitrogen directly from the air, and neither can plants. As a result, N2, the free nitrogen in the atmosphere, must first be changed. Bacteria play a role in changing this nitrogen into a form called nitrates. Nitrates are water soluble. So what will happen is plants will absorb these nitrates along with water through their roots. The nitrates, specifically the nitrogen part, will then be used to build plant protein. We eat plants and we will get plant protein and break it down and use the nitrogen to build our own proteins. When decomposition occurs, one of the products that is produced is ammonia. Ammonia is a toxic substance and that is found in the soil. What is incredibly interesting is that bacteria play a role in a sort of a relay race in changing this ammonia first into a form called nitrites, then into a form called 
nitrates. Now, plants can absorb these nitrates from the soil water and use them again to make plant proteins. There are, however, some harmful bacteria involved in this nitrogen cycle. Those are the denitrifying bacteria, which take the useful nitrates and change them back into nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, which we can't use. So just note the role of bacteria in the nitrogen cycle. Number one, to change it from the form found in the atmosphere to a water-soluble form. Number two, we have bacteria that are involved in decomposition and then a relay race of bacteria to change the harmful product of decomposition back into a form that can be used. And a final kind of bacteria which strips these useful nitrates from the soil and puts them back in the atmosphere. How is this beneficial for the bacteria? They use the chemicals involved in these various processes for their own nutrition. Bacteria also are important in a special kind of a relationship called mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship where you will find that there are two organisms of different species involved and here both benefit from this relationship. One example of mutualistic bacteria that live in a relationship with human beings is a very interesting bacterium called E. coli. Here is how you write its name with a capital E and a full stop and then C-O-L-I. These bacteria are found living in our large intestine. As the end products of digestion move into our large intestine, no further absorption of nutrients by us can occur. But there is still plenty of food left in the fluid in the large intestine. As a result, E. coli feeds on this and receives food from us as well as a home in our large intestine. So what do we get in return? E. coli manufactures some of the B vitamins and very importantly, vitamin K. We absorb this vitamin K into our bloodstream and it is used to help our blood clot. This is a very, very important mutualistic relationship as both organisms involved derive benefits. Bacteria are used in many, many different industries. And one of the main reasons is that they undergo a process called fermentation. First of all, they are used in dairy industries. Dairy industries are responsible for producing a number of different products. Here we will start with milk. And milk contains a special kind of carbohydrate called lactose. When lactose is worked upon by bacteria, what will happen is the bacteria will use it as food to release their energy and lactic acid is the product that is used by us. This lactic acid makes the milk go sour and as the milk goes sour, it can either produce mass or the lumpy bits can be used to make cottage cheese. The same process is also used in manufacturing of wine. One of the byproducts of fermentation can be alcohol. Bacteria are also used for their fermentation process in manufacturing certain traditional things. For example, traditional beer. Traditional beer starts with maize meal, which contains glucose. Glucose is the carbohydrate that bacteria will feed on. This is added to wheat flour, where you will find the bacteria Streptococcus lactis. This bacteria will feed on the glucose 
and will produce lactic acid and with that it will produce alcohol. Look at the word streptococcus. Do you see the coccus part in it? In other words, these are small round bacteria. A large number of bacteria are saprophytes. That means that they feed on dead and decaying organic matter and are therefore decomposers. As mentioned already, certain bacteria can get their food through a special relationship called mutualism. Other bacteria may have special pigments in them and those special pigments enable them to make their own food. Those bacteria are called autotrophic, which means self-feeding. However, a fourth group of bacteria also do occur. These are the ones that are parasites. Remember that a parasite uses its host, in this case for food, and that will always harm the host. As this harms the host, the parasite will cause a disease. As a result, we can use a special word to describe bacteria. We say they are pathogens. Remember, a pathogen is a disease-causing organism. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacterial infection by a special kind of bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosi. This usually attacks the lungs. And tuberculosis is very, very common in areas where there is overcrowding and where there is poor hygiene. Thus, it's quite commonly spread quickly from person to person in places like squatter camps or informal settlements. What happens? You will start to cough up blood and the cough is a deep, harsh sounding cough. You will be short of breath as the coughing and the blood indicates that your lung tissue is being damaged. Pains in the chest, you will lose weight and lose your appetite. You will constantly have a feeling of tiredness and a really, really horrible symptom. You will wake up in the middle of the night having totally soaked your way through your pajamas and your bedclothes from sweating so much. This is called the night sweats. Tuberculosis can be prevented there is a special vaccine called the BCG and in South Africa all children are inoculated with this BCG vaccine. However, if you have already developed tuberculosis, it can still be treated. Remember that it is a bacterial disease and thus will respond to antibiotics. So. Cure will occur with antibiotics and usually you will find that there are several anti-TB drugs that are given at any one time. M-D-R-T-B, which stands for multi-drug resistant TB. This necessitates sufferers being on stronger medication possibly for even a longer period of time. And again, we have also noted a new form of TB having developed. It is called XDRTB, where the X stands for extremely drug resistant. Now these two forms are caused because people do not take their antibiotics for the prescribed length of time. Let's look at how bacteria may be used in medical biotechnology. First of all, bacteria may be used to produce vitamins, antibiotics, proteins, and an example of a hormone that is produced by bacteria for human use is the hormone insulin. 
Insulin is an injectable hormone that helps people who suffer from the disease diabetes to control their blood sugar levels. Here is a schematic bacterial cell with its nucleoid and there is its little extra ring of DNA called a plasmid. A human insulin gene is taken and inserted into the bacterial plasmid. This gene is the gene that instructs the human body to make insulin and is the one that is faulty in a diabetic. As soon as it is inserted into the bacterial cell plasmid, the bacterial cell is literally tricked into making a substance, for example, insulin. But what is really interesting is this bacterial cell is now a mass production factory for human insulin. This is an incredibly important biotechnology development, and we call it recombinant DNA technology. Let's quickly go back and look at the terminology from the beginning of the section. Antibiotics we have covered as a chemical substance that stops the growth of bacteria because remember bacteria are living and antibiotics will kill bacteria. An antiseptic is more or less the same thing but remember that it does its job on the surface. The term decomposer that is going to rot or break down organic matter and return the nutrients to the soil. A saprophyte is an organism that feeds on dead organic matter. Something that is autotrophic can make its own food, remember, self-feeding. And the final term here, mutualism, which we explained with E. coli. Mutualism is a symbiotic relationship where there are two organisms involved and always both must derive benefits. Question one. The first question is to provide labels for specific parts. Part D over here is pointing to this layer. D is the cell wall. Letter G over there, the outgrowth. G is the flagella. And letter E, that thin line over there, E is the cell membrane. Or you could give the correct biological term here, which is the plasma lemma. Each of those labels will get one mark the following part of the question. Again, we have the diagram for easy reference, and now we have to give the role or the function of certain parts. Part A, part A over there, always start by identifying it. It is the nucleoid. What is the function of the nucleoid? Well, like the function of the nucleus, it is going to serve to control the cell. Part G, our second part, again start by identifying what it is. Part G is a flagellum. What is its function? It is there for locomotion and specifically locomotion in liquid. The final part of this question. Here you are asked why disease-causing bacteria have a thick layer of part C. There's part C. What is that? C is our slime capsule. Why would a bacterial cell need a thick slime capsule? First reason, and the most probable answer, is to serve as protection against drying out. However, here it says a reason, so you will get two marks for that answer. Question two shows an experimental design with the bacterium Escherichia coli. Don't let that confuse you. It's just the long way of writing out E. coli. And two 
different antibiotics, namely streptomycin, which is shown by an S, and penicillin, which is shown by the P. So let's look at our diagrams first. Here, where it is the more shaded area, that is where your bacteria are. Where the S is, that is where they have put one antibiotic, the streptomycin. Where your P is, that is where they've put the second one. At the end of the investigation, you can see that things have changed. This area with the P for penicillin is more or less the same. This area with the S for streptomycin is now much bigger. The first question here, state one hypothesis that is being investigated. A hypothesis is always, always a statement. You may not use any question words like if or whether or how. It is also a short statement in which you only need to include variable one and variable two. Now, how can we do this? Variable one and variable two, what are we looking at? We're looking at two antibiotics and we're looking at how effective they're going to be as regards bacteria. So what you could say, name one of the antibiotics, streptomycin, and our second variable is going to be E. coli. But what about the E. coli? Is the streptomycin going to kill the E. coli or not? So in other words, we can say, as an hypothesis, streptomycin is effective against E. coli. Now, how will that be marked? One mark for streptomycin, which is variable one. One mark for the second part of your statement, which is variable two. Now, please note, this is one example. You could have said streptomycin is not effective against E. coli. You could have said penicillin is effective against E. coli. As long as you have two variables and there's a little bit of a description in between, you will get the marks. And remember, a hypothesis statement is going to be worth two marks. The next question. State the aim of the above investigation. When you set up an aim, you can always start it with to show. In this case, what are we looking at? Which antibiotic is most effective? And most effective at doing what? Right, and there's a perfect aim. I've said which antibiotic here I could have specified, and I could have said streptomycin is most effective, or penicillin is most effective. I've generalized it a bit more. But with an aim, you can use which, which is a question word, and you should start it with a to show. The following question reads, describe the results of this investigation. If you look at the diagram shown, streptomycin started off as a relatively small circle where it is clear where there are no bacteria and at the end of the investigation there is a very 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 large area where there is no bacteria. So in other words what has happened from here to here? Our streptomycin has created a clear area where there are no bacteria or a large clear area. Let's look at penicillin there's our area at the beginning. What has happened at the end? It's more or less the same size. Now, back to our question. A result always refers to what can you see. Therefore, we would need to set, no, sorry. Therefore, we would need to first of all say, what can we see with streptomycin, which is there is a large clear area around it with no bacteria 
And what could we see with our other antibiotic, which is penicillin? There has been no change, or you could say the area of no bacteria has not increased. Now remember, that is a result, and that is what you can see. The next question reads, one conclusion from the results. So in other words, the things that you wrote down in the previous question, what do they tell you? In this case, they would tell you that streptomycin is effective in, at killing bacteria, or specifically E. coli, and that will give you two marks because it says one conclusion. Or you could go and use penicillin, where you would say penicillin, not effective at killing E. coli. And again, that kind of a conclusion will still earn your two marks. Next part of the question reads, why is it necessary to incubate the Petri dish? When you incubate the Petri dish, in which you are doing an experiment, what you are doing is you are controlling the temperature or keeping the temperature constant. Either one of those will get you two marks. Question three deals with TB. And it says that TB patients are required to take medication every day for a long period of time and as discussed, that is six months. Many patients do not take their medication for the full period as prescribed. State two reasons why patients would stop their medication early. The first reason, as explained earlier, generally speaking, your TB patients after being on the medication for about a month will start feeling better. As a result, they think, and I emphasize the word think, that they are cured. So they stop taking their medication. But secondly, remember that it's not just one kind of antibiotic. It's a regime. There are a number of antibiotics that have to be taken at certain times every single day for six months. So it becomes a hassle. It is inconvenient, which is a better way of phrasing it, to follow the regime. And for each one, you will get one mark, giving you your total of two. The next question on this little reading introduction, what are the dangers of not taking the medication for the full prescribed period? Now, what is going to happen to these bacteria if you don't kill them all out. And remember we did that funny little graph and there's the line at the top which is where you will start taking your medicine. When you start taking your medicine the numbers drop but there you've stopped. What is going to happen? Numbers are going to increase all over again. So what is going to happen? They're going to start to reproduce again what is going to happen to you, the person? The person is going to get sick again. The bacteria may develop resistance. The next question. Name the program that uses community workers to help patients to take their medicines regularly. Besides helping them take their medicines regularly, it has one other main advantage. What is it? The program is often abbreviated to DOT. This means D for directly, O observed, T treatment. So the DOT treatment involves community members monitoring TB patients and making sure that they take their medication. Now, how is this going to be advantageous? What it means is 90% of the time, the patient who is on this medication will complete 
the course. And therefore, once they've completed the course, they will be cured. Viruses and bacteria are not things that we see every day because, after all, they are microscopic. But isn't it interesting to learn something about forms of life that live on our skin and in the air around us? Well, that's all for viruses and bacteria. <laughs>